We would love to have your company uh, for the morning service. So plenty of time to listen uh, to Sunday school while uh, getting ready and joining us for 11 o'clock morning service. So we will begin as we normally do um, with uh, prayer requests. Um, we want to be continuing to pray for uh, Mike Morgan. Um, this is the Rose's um, son. I haven't heard uh, what the test results were for him yet, um, but they were negative. Well, that's a praise. They were negative for uh, a concern for cancer. Well, let's praise the Lord for that. Uh, for Dana Lane, just had uh, his second eye cataract surgery, and uh, so far everything going good. Um, so continue to be praying for that. Um, we talked to Eleanor Smith. She actually called yesterday, and I think she's doing. I think she's doing better. Um, but um, it's a long haul when you've got like COPD or asthma, and then you get COVID, which is what she had. It uh, it's kept her down. Uh, but continue to pray for her. Continue to pray uh, for Mrs. Shrum, for Mrs. Uh, Hewitt with her uh, recovery from knee surgery. Uh, Mrs. Ratledge was with us here last Sunday. That was a wonderful praise for, like she says, 90-year-old person undergoing, you know, a gallstone, I think it was, removal surgery. She's, uh, she says you just don't bounce back quickly, but she was in church, and I appreciated her faithfulness. Uh, to that end. Be praying for our pastor. He is not feeling well this morning. Was feeling good until this morning. And uh, so pastor, I know you are, uh, you are online with us right now. We will be praying for you to have a quick recovery. We do miss you. Other prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That what? what who? Had to be away from oh yeah, yeah. There was something with uh, one of the family. Ki family members. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's be praying for the Foresters. And then, uh, uh, Colette. Colette. She um, is going to be having surgery on Wednesday to have her throat surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So let's be praying for the Lane's uh, dear friend Colette and uh, procedure she's going to need um, this Wednesday, plus several other health-related issues uh, for her. Beth? I got a couple. Uh, the PET scan from Dennis's mom, the doctor does not think that this mass on her ovary is cancerous. Wow. But her thyroid lit up and some gland or lymph node next to it. And so now she has to see a doctor on Tuesday about that. They were more concerned about that than this. Okay. Whatever is on her. Own. So it could be, well, I'm not going to guess at stuff, <laughs> but like fibroid. Uh, Maybe something like that. Something like that, but still. Um, Dennis has to have a spot behind his ear looked at Tuesday from a dermatologist that looks a little weird. Okay, good. I'm glad he's going in and not waiting on that. And then, uh, <laughs> well, you know what, boy, they sure do a better job than they used to. I mean, uh, uh, Isaac, what they used to do is, you know, <laughs> but nowadays it's a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're living in a good time, Isaac, for that kind of stuff. They just give you that good old g laughing gas and... Yes, ma'am. Okay, from the list we had on Thursday, um, we had Ricky's, um, Ricky Ronaball. Am I saying that right? Who's that? Ronaball. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. We had Ricky coming up on 615. That was heart related. Yep. And then we got Ricky Foster on 6 6. That's tomorrow. Yep, that's. Reversed. Oh. Ronaball's on the 6th. Ricky's oh. on the 15th. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, so those that may not have heard that, we've got some upcoming procedures or tests. So the Foster's uh, friend, uh, Mr. Gronewald, uh having a heart procedure 
tomorrow. Because if I recall correctly, uh, his circulation, at least in one of those, is really low. He's not getting all the blood he ought to be getting to the heart. So, And then Ricky Foster on the 15th will be having some tests, and Richard Ward on 621 will be having some tests. One more. Yes? Uh, Thursday we'll be on the highway traveling, so pray for us for next week, weekend. Okay. We won't be back until Monday, uh, Monday evening probably. So you're going on a little vacation? Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. You know, that was on the installment plan, apparently. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, wonderful. Janie. Okay. She she needs prayer. She had several complications. She's still in the hospital. What was the last name again? Dursey. 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 Okay. Any unspoken? Yes. Okay. And Beth had one too. Okay. Okay, we've got several. And I'm looking around. Any other prayer requests? All right, wonderful. Well, Brother Tom, you look as sharp as always. My wife does. Well, we don't need to get into that detail. I mean, uh, but um, she must have good taste then. But you're looking sharp, and uh, would you open us in prayer this morning? Our dear Lord, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you for the many, many blessings in our life, Lord. The ones that we're not even aware of, Lord. Mm -hmm. that you watch yeah. over us, you keep us. And Lord, we lift up for all those that are ill, they're going to have tests, medical issues, Lord. We just pray that you'll be with them. Lord, we pray for good results, Lord. We, we just thank you that they're in your hands, Lord, not ours. And we just, Lord, we pray that you'll touch them and... Lord, if they need conviction, give them conviction. Those that need to come closer and know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that you work on their hearts and their families also, Lord. We pray for travel mercies for all that are going to be traveling as vacation time is starting. And we just thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to travel. Lord, and we thank you for this country. And Lord, we pray for conviction on this country. We just pray, Lord, that your hand, we pray that we will be good testimony mm -hmm. for you, Lord, that we will reach out, touch people with the word of God. And Lord, we just pray you be with our speakers today. We thank you, Lord, that again, for this opportunity to come here for Sunday school and for church services. And Lord, we just pray you be with the speakers, and we pray, Lord, that we will truly discern your word. Mm -hmm. And we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, you may open to Ephesians 5 and, uh, and hold tight there. We'll get there here in just a minute or so. But um, Jacob, um, the, the uh, lesson today is a le lesson 11 under the Church Covenant series entitled Caring for the Bride. Caring for the Bride-to-be. So today marks our arrival in the fourth of five paragraphs. If you were to look at our Constitution or our covenant, we are just about done. Um, and I'm sure that others could uh, actually drill down far deeper, but we are, we are getting down uh, to the very end of reviewing this covenant, which has basically been about... Um, uh, all going on almost six six months. So we're about done with that. We'll be having, by the way, in the month of June, a couple uh, missionary uh, guests, uh, candidates, I believe. Next Sunday, we will be having a candidate um, from uh, who going to Italy. 
I'm not sure if the individual, they're already in Italy, or I believe it's they're preparing to go to Italy. So um, we have a couple uh, wonderful opportunities uh, in the month of June as well to see how our church may be able to uh, uh, come alongside these individuals and, and help them in, in the calling that the Lord has placed on their life. But um, if we were to read the fourth paragraph of uh, our covenant, it would say this. We further engage to watch over another, one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy and speech, slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. And so as I thought about uh, this portion of our covenant, um, I really thought about it from the standpoint of taking care of the bride to be. Now, if you're in Ephesians 5, let me give you a scriptural foundation or, or, or context to this. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22, and we'll read down to the end of uh, this chapter. You know it very well, but it has a, a wonderful application for our covenant to take care of each other. Wives, submit yourselves and your own husbands uh, uh, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. The church is the bride to be. Anxiously, I hope, anxiously awaiting the arrival of the bridegroom. Uh, there's not hardly a day, I do goof up once in a while, but uh, there's not hardly a day that uh, in our prayer at home, we are telling the Lord, today would be a wonderful day for your return. And, um, and so, the, of course, the bridegroom is Christ Jesus. And the start that we're looking for is the start of an eternal, glorious union of Christ and his bride, the church whom Christ loved so much that he gave himself so that he could do what nobody else could do, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The rapture is the portal by which the bridegroom will call out his bride, the church. And beginning with the dead, in, as we all know, if we were to go to 1 Thessalonians, beginning with the dead in Christ, momentarily followed 
by I pray all of us. I pray that all of us are part of that most fortunate generation that will exist at the time when there shall be the shout of the archangel and the call. And it will, will truly be, even momentarily, it does not do justice. We will just flat out be absent and present with the Lord. And somehow the dead in Christ will beat us there. And that's okay with me. But I pray that we shall be part of that most fortunate generation to be uh, experience that rapture directly uh, as the first Thessalonians speaks of those that are alive. So Revelation, Revelation 19 addresses the marriage of the Lamb. The heavenly presentation of the spotless, righteous bride and the marriage supper of the Lamb. But as of this very moment, the bride-to-be is still awaiting the bridegroom's arrival. And she, the church, needs a lot of attention and care to ensure she is ready for the bridegroom's arrival. So I could not resist making sort of this correlation between the church uh, as the bride and something that um, my wife and I had a chance to experience almost one year ago. Are you knowing what I'm talking about? Almost one year ago that we had an opportunity to go down to Tennessee uh, with the Doro clan um, in the days leading up to the wedding of Jacob and Anna. And not unlike any other wedding, the day before the wedding and the day of the wedding centered on the groom. No, no, the, the groom is, you know, secondary. Who, what's all the attention being focused on? The bride. Um, and even beyond that, I, I learned, I was reminded firsthand last year that it's the bridesmaids and, and it's the mothers of the bride and the, and the groom and the grandmothers and, um, and the extras. The Rileys were just the extras, so Sharon was one of the extras. But, but what I come to find out, Tom, is the reason why guys are even part of this whole thing is because we carry that extra large uh, bank bag <laughs> to cover all the planned and the unplanned expenses that come with those final Hours of preparation necessary to get that bride and all the other important women, get them all ready for that very special event. And I will never forget on the morning of the wedding, driving Sharon, Joyce and Tom had already beat us to where, we, where I'm going about to tell you. But in my opinion, this was a home perched so high, there shouldn't be homes up there. Uh, uh, and this high, I guess a mountain, overlooking Gatlinburg. And we were doing these S things, back and forth, back and forth, working our way up. And I, this is no lie, the day before, uh, we went and did a trial run to see, this is where the bride and her family uh, had rented this home for this occasion. And this is where they were bringing in all these, you know, uh, beauticians and, and whatnot. And, and so we did the, we did the uh, day before drive-by, if you will. Um, and I was literally spinning tires at one point. Um, going up a the final driveway. Uh, everything just was steep, absolutely steep. Um, in fact, um, we, our, our car that we took, um, I didn't think it was a real low rider, but we had to actually, to get up the driveway to the final point to this home, um, we had to back up into somebody else's driveway across the road to get the right angle to get going up that hill, right? And um, there, there was some type of rain, something with the asphalt, and it caught. 
It caught the bottom of the car, so we have a little tattoo we've been carrying around ever since then from it. But I'm like, really? People live this high up? Um, but, but there we go. We, day of the wedding, all the girls got to be there, right? And um, I mean, they have natural beauty. There was a lot of natural beauty. The bride was already beautiful, but the beauticians were brought in to accentuate, I guess, uh, that natural beauty that God had given these women. Um, and the guys, well, we were sort of chaperoned down into the lower level. And, um, um, and we had a good time down there, Tom. And the truth is, there were things we said about the women that remain a secret to this very day. <laughs> but we had plenty of good laughs about what was going on upstairs and, and so forth. Um, and then all of a sudden, we heard these screams. <laughs> there were screams coming from upstairs. And it wasn't about them talking about us, but because Smokey the bear has showed up at the door. And uh, am, I not, am I telling the truth? Telling the truth, Smokey the bear, big old brown bear, showed up uh, at the door. Um, and uh, so we're like, hey, we got to see this too, you know. Um, I mean, that's what they had. They had all these snacks up there. And I don't remember any of those snacks being downstairs, by the way, do you? But they had all kinds of interesting treats to keep the girls content upstairs. That's what Smokey the Bear, why he showed up at the front door. But that was my first real uh, close experience myself because we had to go outside. As soon as the bear, we saw the bear, I got pictures of the bear. And as soon as the bear just sort of rumbled over one of the walls to move on to the next house, I mean, I never knew a bear stunk like that. Um... Or was that where the stink was coming from? I'll leave that alone. Could have been from the upper level. I don't know. No, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble. But anyways, I'll never forget that experience uh, of that particular day. And truly, Jacob's wife, Anna, she was just smashing. She was beautiful, but so were all the girls. I remember Miss Hannah dressed up. She was beautiful, and I could go down the list. All the girls were beautiful that day, and Tom and I, and Jeff, and, and whatnot. I mean, uh, we it wasn't important about us, was it? I mean, we were just behind, and that's the way it was supposed to be. The bride was to be the center of attention. Well, as I thought about this part of our covenant, our church covenant calls upon us to look after each other to ensure that we collectively, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, remains ready for his arrival. We are to watch over one another. We are to remember each other, to aid each other, to cultivate each other. The job of keeping the church ready for Christ's return is a full-time, hands-on job that is motivated by a sacrificial love that is no less than what many of us have witnessed in preparing our daughter or granddaughter uh, uh, for her wedding day. No less than that. We have to take care of each other. We are the bride of Christ. So when we joined Community Baptist Church, we did enter into a covenant with each other akin to the sacred vows each couple make to each other on their wedding day. You remember these. I mean, I know there's different variations of it, but you'll remember these. My wife has reminded me of them from time to time to have and to hope from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer or poor in sickness or in health to love and to cherish until for the purpose of our church covenant, the Lord either calls us elsewhere or calls us home or as we're looking forward to, the Lord's rapturing of the church out of this world. 
Obviously, our covenant speaks of our commitment to each other in less intimate terms. But when you think about it, our commitment to each other as the body of Christ at Community Baptist Church is no less important in scope and duration. We have all committed to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and in distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in our speech. And as we've seen and read and have experienced even in our own lives, the importance of being slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation. I mean, think about this. Many of us, you're, you're getting ready to celebrate your 54th wedding anniversary. All right, who's next? Who's next? Who's, who's at 50 yet? Okay, we have got um, the Fenlands have already, are you at 50 right now or more? In February. I've, okay, cool. And Doral's, how close, are you 51 now, 52? It'll be uh, 50, 53. Okay, 53. See, he got it right. That was fill in the blank and he got it right. So, um, and, and uh, the wards, how long? 47. Be 45 for us. Okay. Mrs. Greenhaw. Oh, there we go. There's the cake winner right there. The Rileys are around. We're getting ready to have our 48th. How long, Pam? We're at 44. There we go. All right. So let me, I said all that, asked all this for one thing. Slow to offense, take offense but always ready for reconciliation. Uh, is that not true? If, a, if we are to live and be married as long as many of us have been, reconciliation is part of it, isn't it? It isn't my home anyways. <laughs> In fact, this is true now. My wife says, I want you to give me the first five minutes of your lesson today. To let people know how, what kind of a bad boy you are. Uh, I got the bruises over on this arm to show for it. But yesterday was my birthday. And I figured that if there's one day, my son-in-law eggs me on with it. Uh, we got the cars out yesterday. And um, if you go over to TC's, um, just between TC's and, and the, um, the, the blinking light, you ought to see a little bit of rubber on the road. Because I've left a couple tattoos there, so has he, and, and whatnot. But as, well, anyways, she says, you give me five minutes of your lesson. I want to, well, we've made up. I mean, she smacked me, and I'm like, okay, that's what I deserve to get smacked for that. I sort of enjoyed both, leaving the tattoo and getting smacked, actually. <laughs> but kidding aside, reconciliation. That's necessary. I mean, the truth is, if, if it's not possible for reconciliation when those differences occur, when those grievances occur, then you can just about be sure the path will be towards a marriage that's going to fall apart. And um, so anyways, um, that just speaks about how important it is even for us. Um, as in taking care of ourselves as the bride to be, that there will be times we have to make make whole or remedy things that we may have allowed to fester here or become personal within our body here because we're to take care of that bride. We're to keep that bride looking just really special because we don't know the Lord could be calling that bride out today. I have a couple thoughts about this. First, 
We have a collective responsibility to lovingly watch over each other. So you'll see a little repetitive of this, but that's because I want it to sort of, you know, sink in a little bit. To lovingly watch over each other, to pray for each other, to aid each other. For what reason? For preserving the testimony. You spoke about the testimony, Brother Tom. Preserving the testimony of this church at a time when it is not popular, not convenient, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts in preference for living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. It is not convenient. Rather, compromise is uh, really uh, the name of the game for churches that want to to see their, their 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 see real growth. Well, one of the formulas out there is just take away God's word, take away what clearly is divisiveness. Yes, the word of God is dividing, and it is light versus darkness. Um, and um, so when we think about us as the bride and keeping this bride spotless to the best that we can. We're not perfect because we ourselves individually are not perfect. There is coming that transfer transformation and it's going to come because the groom, Christ, is going to transform us and give us that spotless, wrinkle-free, if you will, sinless uh, appearance that will make us worthy for his very presence. But we ought to, in the meantime, still be very um, desirous of doing what we can to preserve not only the, our testimony as, of, as his bride, but preserving the testimony of the bridegroom. S Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath, a, hath appeared to all men. Well, which, by the way, if it's appeared to all men, it ought to sink in right here amongst all of us. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man Despise thee. Of course, that's the counsel of, of Paul to young Titus. As I read and attempted to consider the fullness of this passage I just read, I was first drawn to the cure that remains available for all that desire a right relationship with God and with man. For all who desire safety and stability in their home, in their nation. For all who desire peace in time of trouble. Even more so when death makes a calling. The cure, this cure, cannot be legislated by our Congress. It cannot be appropriated or funded by our Senate. It cannot be conveyed by an executive order of the president, though it seems as though executive orders is, seems to be the way of our presidents nowadays. Nor can it be adjudicated by the justices of the Supreme Court. For this cure is only available by the grace of God that bringeth salvation. How is the cure obtained? The brevity and clarity of this answer is included 
in Titus 2, um, excuse me, 1, verses 1 and 2. Just 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Speaking of you and me. And the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. There's the cure. If our Congress truly cared about this nation, if our president had a genuine care for this nation then all they need to do is give attention to the word of God and all the malignancies of this nation the disregard for authority and laws the disregard for the laws of nature, the disregard for life, the exaltation of all that is perverse, the preference for drugs over sobriety, and we all could build on this list. That's just the easy little hanging fruit that I could name. We all could... we. Excuse me, all that's wrong in our nation and our homes today, all of that could be cured if our leaders, if our neighbors would begin to simply acknowledge the grace of God that bringeth salvation. To it, the virgin birth, the blameless life, the sufficient sacrifice of Christ Jesus upon that cruel cross that sufficiently then satisfied the sin debt of this world at that time and every day thereafter, this day included tomorrow should the Lord tarry as well. Or as Paul says much better, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Boy, our nation just needs God. They need to see that the word of God is the truth. That everything else that is being uh, espoused out there uh, is hopeless, absolutely hopeless. Um, and, uh, you know, every day it seems like we're seeing horrendous reports of mayhem. Uh, last night, apparently, in Philadelphia, a bunch of people shot, some of them dead. Um, I mean, <laughs> every day. Every day. And by the way, did you notice there, there was a big uh, event? I think this was the one in Tulsa. They didn't use a gun. I think they used a knife to stab a couple doctors and a and couple others. And then, and then the, 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 the coward, um, you know, he stabbed himself. And I wish he would have died, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, wasn't willing to face justice. For what he did, um, guns, the guns are not the problem. And um, I worry very much about those who say that we got to take away the guns. Now, just in this past week, what did they say? Oh, uh, the president said, oh, it's the nine millimeter. The nine millimeter is the, you know, horrendous assault weapon. And I'm like, uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one of the first um, suicides I went to, a 22. A 22 was more than sufficient um, to kill the guy. 
I don't think the guy really intended on killing himself. I think he was doing it for, for attention, but um, he put the, 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 uh, long, uh, nah, the short barrel, if you will, 22, uh, up to uh, his uh, abdominal cavity, and wouldn't you know, it pierced his aorta. And um, when I got to the, I went to the scene and then followed the body over to the emergency room. They were still trying to resuscitate him. But there was a point where, you know, they do the, what you see on TV. Let's, uh, let's call it, you know, let's stop, you know. And, uh, but I mean, a 22 did it. Um, you know, the last I knew, strangulation still works pretty good for killing people. You know, I mean, you can't stop. It's in the heart. It's the heart. Uh, of, of, a, of, of a person. You've got to work on that heart. And there's nothing that will cure all the evil that is rampant in our nation except for the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. Well, that was, that was the rabbit trail. So, my dear friends, why must we lovingly watch over each other, pray for each other, aid each other because it is our responsibility not only to preserve the testimony of this church but by and through our daily walk individually and then even us all that we may do as a church body um, as the body of Christ that we are to be zealous of good works that affirm the word of truth and he who gave uh, truth, Jesus Christ, that through him it is possible to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's my first thought. My second thought is this. When we watch over each other, pray for each other, aid each other, we cultivate and prosper the faithfulness of the church as she awaits Christ's return. Turn to Hebrews 10. The book of faith. Hebrews 10. And verse 19 down through 25. Hebrews 10 starting in Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I said earlier that the job of keeping the church ready for Christ's return is a full-time, hands-on job that, as we just read, includes, among other things, holding fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Now, our shingle describes us as an independent, fundamental Baptist church. And I just want to say there is even a higher distinction. We are the redeemed of Christ. And we are to know God's word. We are to reverence 
God's word. We are to seek forgiveness when we violate God's word. And we are to continue not to rest on the laurels of what we, our good works may have been yesterday, but we are to be zealous in pursuing good works in the name of our Lord and Savior each and every new day. Now, I first thought about this and said, let's put some wheels on this bike, thinking about um, my wife and I, our experience um, up at Mackinac Island a couple weeks ago. Um, we really enjoyed biking, did not enjoy the mayflies. Um, but, you know, even as I thought about that, <laughs> you know, we persevered. We, 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 we thought that every time we started to get a new angle around the island. So we left from where our hotel was at near downtown, but fortunately not right downtown. And we headed to the west. And we were running into the mayflies. Well, maybe when we, the, uh, the, the road turns more to the north, it'll be better because we'll get some wind. Uh, nope, that didn't work. Uh, eventually, well, we'll be turning back to the east. Oh, man, it seemed to get worse. We got to the midway point, and we got off our bikes. And we were, we were like, man, do we turn around? I'm, well, we're midway. I mean, those that we were running into coming this far are still going to be there. So let's keep going. And uh, until we got right back to downtown Mackinac City, or Mackinac Island. Um, what do they call that downtown? Just Mackinac Island, right? Mackinac City is across on the, where the trolls live, I guess. But, uh, but <laughs> we just ran into them. I mean, we persevered. Well, um, there are times when the bride has to just persevere. The bride, in, the bride to be, the bride in waiting, if you will, has to persevere because not every day is going to be a great day. But that bride holds to her heart dearly that that day is coming and that God, the, 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 the groom, our Lord and Savior, desires for us to remain faithful. Uh, until he comes. So we, we, as I thought about this, um, there are some ways, and there's probably a whole lot more, but I wanted to sort of make some application here that we can ensure the bride of Christ here at Community Baptist Church remains ready for the Lord's call. One way is we have a collective responsibility to equip the church nursery. Well, just think about this as I give this as my first example and others to equip the church nursery with everything necessary for the care of babies because I believe some babies are going to come. Don't you? I believe there's going to be some babies coming. I'm not trying to focus any attention over certain parts of the church, okay? But, you know, I am expecting that one day we are going to have some babies. Maybe the Lord will bring a young couple today that will have a baby and will need that nursery. But it needs to be equipped with everything necessary for the care of babies in an environment that rivals the pride of Parents have in their own home nursery, especially that very first time, the baby, the first baby showing up, you know, got to do everything we possibly can, you know, uh, for this baby, even though the baby will never have a memory about that little, that room, you know, um, that was set aside for them. Um, Equally important is our collective responsibility to provide the best care possible by and through those within our membership given the privilege of attending to these babies. Now, I'm not the guy that should be on that list. I'm not. That's all there is to it. My wife, is, that her, is there a second to that? <laughs> she says, Amen. <laughs> I don't think I did that bad of a job, okay? She says that I didn't like certain parts of the job, and I'm going to say, who does like certain parts of the job, okay? But anyways, we have some very talented people in this church that got a heart, got that natural affinity for just 
understanding the sound language, okay? The sound language of a baby between a baby that really has a need and a baby that's just wanting to remind you they're there and whatnot. And above all, we have a collective responsibility that as God gifts this church, you notice the word gifts, because that's how I consider it, gifts this church with the presence of babies that we will pray for the Lord's protection over them and their parents, that we will be ready to encourage and aid the parents in raising their newborn in a godly home. So we got to keep that nursery ready. Because that's one of our responsibilities. That is part of the bride. The bride is to have a nursery always ready, waiting. And may I say such that if this is a new couple coming and they come as mom's going to do to bring that baby back there, mom may decide to stay back there with her newborn or mom may entrust that. But I want that mom to, uh, to look back there and say, wow. They must think it's pretty special to have babies here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We have a collective responsibility to come alongside the parents who bring their children or send their children by way of bus or other transportation to attend Sunday school as they are right now, or junior church, or the Wednesday night kids programs, or our, our teen program, and provide these children with a safe, caring environment that seeks above all things to help their parents bring these children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As pastors, as teachers, because there are some here that, are, that have that role as a teacher uh, for these young children, but all of us as members, we must watch over these children, pray for these children, Encourage these children, aid these children, and show love and concern for these children. Well, we have a collective responsibility to encourage and pray for and come alongside our single adults who may be college students or have entered the job market, or who may be seeking the Lord's will for their life, or may be seeking that special someone from the Lord to unite in marriage. Our singles need our care and our attention and our encouragement. Hey, Jacob! You, you just graduated to be one of them. So congratulations on that. We have a collective responsibility to promote the heterosexual, monogamous institution of marriage as God's design for a lifelong yoke between two Christians desiring companionship, comfort, the strength of two, and should the Lord bless, the stability of a godly home to raise up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There are two sacred institutions. Marriage is one, that home, and the church is the second. What's the third? Government, government, God uses government. In America, though, in the United States, we are to elect that government. I am praying for a wholesale change in our government come this November. But the home, a whole lot of things in this country would be a lot better if our homes were stable. 
And we need to exalt that institution of marriage and the home as being something very special, just as the church is very special. And lastly, among so many other examples, we have a collective responsibility to help the body of Christ prepare for death should the Lord tarry by praying, watching over, aiding those who are being called home, and encouraging, comforting, and coming alongside the surviving family members when death arrives. Drawing upon the scriptures that their loved one may be absent, their body asleep, but they are very much alive with Christ, awaiting a future reunion with their body and with their loved ones. I believe it was one of the Wesleys, um, I can't recall if it was John or Charles Wesley, but um, in, uh, in sort of being asked about, uh, probably looking back on his ministry, uh, some of the important things um, uh, that he really relished. And I believe one of the things that he spoke of was continually as a pastor preparing his church, his people for death. To die well. And you know, I think that there is something to be said about that. That even here as a church body, even as our pastors are led by the, the Lord and, and what they will periodically uh, preach to the church, we need to continue to fortify and build up that hope that makes our death, should that happen, a whole lot different than the death of an unsaved person. Well, that's just some of the examples of what we can do that would has a real application in helping each of us together as the body of Christ to help keep that bride to be looking beautiful, ready for the Lord's return. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the blessing of your word. And Lord, we are looking for your return. May it even be today, Lord, if that is the Father's will. We pray that we'll continue to be, be, maintain that testimony, your testimony, Lord, and that we would remain faithful to you. Now, we do pray above all for our pastor, that you would continue to bring healing and recovery into his body because we desire for him to be here as, Lord, the shepherd you've given us. And we pray that we'll now uh, prepare for the morning service, Lord, to give honor and glory and worship to you, Lord Jesus. Amen.